Well, the British Medical Journal, The Lancet, released a comprehensive new report last week detailing the interconnectivity of health and the climate crisis. Dr. Nick Watts is the executive director of The Lancet Countdown, and he is good enough to join us now via satellite uh, from London to discuss all. And Dr. Watts, again, we do thank you for your time. And I wonder, uh, in your opinion, what were the most significant findings in this year's report as it related to the physical and mental health impacts of rising temperatures all about the globe? Sure. And um, let me start by saying thank you. Thank you for, for putting on such a great show and thank you for having us along on behalf of The Lancet and The Lancet Countdown. Um, the, the report is a long report, um, as, as all good reports are. It, it details all of the different ways in which climate change and public health are interconnected. It's published on behalf of the World Health Organization, University College London, Tsinghua University, the University of Washington, 27 institutions. Um, like I said, it's very long. But there are really three clear things that come out of the report, three clear ways that climate change and public health are, are interconnected. The first clear thing, uh, the first clear message from the 41 indicators that we track is that the health impacts of climate change are things that we're experiencing not in 2050, not in 2030, but they're things that we're experiencing today. We see very clear evidence of, of public health being influenced right the way through the various environmental determinants of health uh, already today. And, and what is what is absolutely certain from the report is that no country, no population, no patient is immune to these to these health impacts. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we've known about this for quite some time. Um, we've been able to track these health impacts for, for quite some time now. Um, and what we've seen is that there's been there's been a lot of delay over the last 20 years, 30 years. There's been delay in response to the health system adaptation, and there's been delay in, in mitigation and in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that delay is putting health systems, it's putting hospitals, it's putting doctors and nurses at risk of being overwhelmed by some of these health impacts. It's putting critical public health infrastructure at risk of being overwhelmed by some of these health impacts. That's the second, that's the second clear message that comes out of the report. The third one is, is maybe a little bit more optimistic. It's that we have a choice. Either we continue down the path that we're facing at the moment and we don't respond, and we expect to see some of these health systems around the world that all of us depend on for good health, for our well-being. We expect to see them overwhelmed by some of the impacts of climate change. Or we have a more positive path. We have a path that responds to climate change and, and yields all sorts of public health benefits. Those are the three key messages. Well, then I want to get you back to that first message as it regards the health risks. What did you find uh, yeah. were the biggest ones uh, for people there in the UK? Sure. So, so the United Kingdom faces really three key risks immediately. The first is that of heat and heat wave. We know, we know that vulnerable populations, people aged over, over the age of 65, people living in uh, urban, urban settings, people with chronic kidney disease or congestive heart failure, pre-existing conditions, are particularly exposed, particularly vulnerable to some of the worst impacts of extreme heat. When you get hit by that, uh, that sort of heat, not just one day, but two days, three days, five days in a row, it exacerbates chronic kidney disease. You, you, end up, you end up seeing repeat kidney strain, repeat acute kidney injury. You see exacerbations of uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, disorder from the worsening air pollution that comes from the heat. And you see, you see additional strain placed on the heart, um, worsening congestive heart failure. So that's the first impact that, that people in, in the United Kingdom are facing. They're also facing risks from floods. We know that a very large proportion of NHS, National Health Service facilities, infrastructure, is currently situated on high-risk floodplains. Now, as a result of the growth of the NHS and as a result of climate change, we're expecting to see that number increase. In fact, we're expecting it to see it almost double by 2050. Um, and then finally, we're seeing the spread of, of vector-borne diseases, particularly for the United Kingdom, uh, we're, we're looking at tick-borne diseases. As the climate changes, the interaction between some of these tick-borne diseases and, and humans starts to increase, the seasonality shifts a little bit, and it doesn't take much to suddenly see little spikes of admissions from, from some of these tick-borne diseases. Uh, this Those is... are the three very clear impacts. But the other thing that's really important to remember is that the United Kingdom is interconnected. So when the rest of the world experiences issues with uh, food supply or uh, crop productivity, where migration happens as a result of climate change, 
the United Kingdom isn't insulated from that. It feels those impacts intimately. And also um, problems such as air pollution also interconnected. I know one of the 10 recommendations outlined in the report is uh, the eventual phasing out of coal uh, and uh, other dependencies on fossil fuels. How then exactly do emissions from coal-fired power plants, for instance, uh, impact uh, the health of uh, the surrounding communities there? Yeah. So, so when a doctor sits down and looks at all of the things that an engineer or an economist wants to do to respond to climate change, uh, yes, we see uh, interventions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But to be honest, I just see sensible public health interventions. We know that more people die from coal-fired power plants every year in the United Kingdom than do from motor vehicle accidents. Now, they die from uh, smoke, from particulates getting into their lungs and going to their brain, causing stroke causing heart attack when it gets to the heart, causing lung cancer. Um, it, it has impacts on little kids whose, whose, um, whose, whose lungs, just as they're developing, are sort of taking in some of these most toxic materials. Um, that health impact is, is particularly concerning. What is, what is maybe more positive is that around the world, we're starting to see countries phase out their dependence on, on coal-fired power partly because of climate change reasons, but to be honest, partly because it's just a sensible public health intervention. We know in the United Kingdom, we're expecting them to phase out coal-fired power by, by the mid-2020s. Uh, mid and around the world, we're seeing countries commit to that, uh, commit to that, um, that phase out. What we've seen globally, and one of the indicators we track because of its importance on public health, is a total primary energy supply from coal. In 2013, that heat hit the highest level ever. And ever since 2013, total primary energy supply from coal has been decreasing. And that decrease has resulted in enormous public health benefits. Public health benefits that, to be honest, are, are covering the investment cost of that phase out. So very quickly then, uh, Dr. Watts, uh, we uh, are almost out of time, but I do uh, want to end on a glass half full perspective. Is there reason for optimism uh, that you saw with the release of this report? Yeah, there, ab there absolutely is. And the reason for optimism is that we are seeing the health profession begin to respond. We've seen the Royal College of General Practitioners, we've seen the British Medical Association, the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, the American Medical Association, all commit to divest from fossil fuels, take their investments out of fossil fuels. And they do this partly based on the evidence that we have in the report and from the World Health Organization, but they do this because they wouldn't invest in tobacco, they wouldn't invest in alcohol, and they acknowledge that fossil fuels is just one of the same. They wouldn't invest in something that would directly harm uh, the health of their patients. And when we start to see the health profession respond to some of these issues, I think that's when we're going to start to see a, a real shift in public policy. Well, it also takes shining a light on these issues, and it's uh, the work of The Lancet that is doing just that. And again, uh, Dr. Watts, we very much appreciate the work you do, and we very much appreciate you joining us today to discuss it all.